Well, let's open our Bibles. You've got a scripture that you say, okay, I want you to read that scripture loud and clear. Tell us yes, what sir. it is. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. 323 Colossians. Everybody got it? All right, read that for me, please. This is all about how to behave and respond and interact with uh, on the job, you know, in, in our employment. So go. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. I could actually read that 325. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say right there, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Whatever you do, read it again. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Because we are working for whom? The Lord. The Lord. We are no longer enslaved to men. Even though you've got to get a job someplace, we're not enslaved to men. Right. You know, one of the worst things that you have to do is, it, one of the worst things, one of the things that takes away your freedom is to work for money. Work for the Lord because God put you there, because God's doing something through you. You know what I'm saying? When you begin to work for money, you've immediately begin to get enslaved. Because you'll never make enough. <laughs> you'll never make enough. That's just the way it is. And so begin to recognize you're not enslaved to man or mammon, but you are serving the Lord. And read Ephesians again, please. Or er, Colossians. Colossians again. Uh, I'll read to you 25. Um, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is for the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who, he who does wrong will, be, will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So that's a pretty good little uh, section of scripture to live by, is it not? Who are we serving? The Lord. The Lord. So when we're on the job, I don't care if Billy Bob Thornton hires us to change tires. We're still serving God, are we not? All right. All right. Now, would somebody read Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8 for me, please? Not everybody all at once now. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. <laughs> Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of the heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Don't just work hard when the boss is watching. Uh, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Amen. So you see, our whole key, the key is, who are we serving? Our whole mindset, the whole premise from which we live life from here on out is, who are we serving? Who are we following? What is the purpose of our life? See, one of the great big uh, advantages, one of the goals and, and adventures of your life is to determine God's perfect will for your life. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test and prove what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. That all comes through an inter interactive relationship with God trying to teach you to have here. The whole key is to interact with God through every situation of life. When we get on the job, we don't work for that man as much as we work for God. Sure, we're going to serve him. We're going to do what he's asking us to do. But we're working for the Lord. We're to be the best employees that the world's ever seen. We're to be the most conscientious men on earth. We're to be those who, who, who are there with a higher call than just to make a few bucks. All right? You grab that revelation, I guarantee you, it'll make your life a whole lot easier. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. Malachi 1 6, anybody know what that says? A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you. <coughs> o priests who despise my name, but you say, How have we despised your name? You're going a little further. Uh, you are presenting the defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? Just read the first part of it. 1-6, Malachi. A servant honors his father. Honors his, a, a, a man honors his father, and a servant honors his master. 
How do we honor our, our bosses? By working. By, <laughs> good, by doing what we're paid to do. Yeah, going beyond the call of duty. Okay, Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. What does that say? Somebody loud and clear. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person <clears throat> is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, <clears throat> for the anger of God will fall on those who disobey. <clears throat> Don't participate in the things these people do. Pretty simple. Don't do what the rest of the world does. Yep. Don't fall prey to the traps that will be set for you. Be a rebel. Pardon? Be a rebel, be a rebel for Christ. Yes. That's right. In a positive sort of way, it's a rebel. That's right. We're exactly opposite from the rest of the world. <laughs> and that's our goal. To shine. To be somebody <laughs> that the rest of the world is not. And that comes through our words. It comes through our actions. That comes through our through our willingness to be the, the, the leaders and the, the good employees. That's why we work hard and desire really in a great way for you all to become what I call student leaders. People who can set some examples and hold others accountable and say, no, that's not called for. That's not right for men of God. So begin to get the idea that you are not just men, but you're men of God. You're spiritual men. The Spirit of God lives in you. Great things can happen through you as you begin to lean more into God and honor God. And we honor God by giving our employers our best, giving our parents our best, giving everybody around us our best, so that we can be blessings on all occasions. Amen? First Timothy 5 8. Would somebody read that for me, please? That's 6 1 1st Timothy 6, 1, 2. Um, refuse to grumble about your employer. Mm. Refuse to grumble about your employer. Talk to me about that, somebody. If your employer gave you a job to support your family, uh, you shouldn't grumble about it. If you accept a job that maybe doesn't make as much money as you, you want or whatever, but you accepted it um, until you can find another job, uh, you should uh, respect your employer. That simple. Respect your employer. Listen to me, guys. <clears throat> One of the favorite pastimes of the American worker is to belittle their employer and belittle their health, the place where they're employed. I think that's sad. Because when you take a job, if you have questions about what you're going to be paid, the length of hours, the days off, how far away the parking lot is, etc., 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 ask it before you accept the job. Because once that job's accepted, here's the sad thing that happens. Once that job's accepted and we begin to work and kind of get into the routine, things become kind of humdrum, don't they? First, it seems exciting, new place, new face, new everything. But then all of a sudden, it gets to be kind of a humdrum situation. We begin to find fault. Why do we find fault? Because our minds continuously look at the things that are uncomfortable to us. Anything that causes us an discomfort, anything that causes us an inconvenience, we begin to pick it apart in our mind, and pretty soon now our mind's working on it, we begin to talk about it, talk about it. Refuse to talk about it. Refuse to let your mind do that to you. You took a job, you knew what you were being paid, you knew the details of the job, rejoice that you have that job, rejoice that that employer uh, uh, thought something of you and saw something in you and offered you that position, rejoice in that. Talk good about the man or the person or the organization that brought you in. Talk good about the organization that's doing whatever service they're doing. Talk good about it. Be their best cheerleader. Listen to me. When you leave a job, you should always leave your employee wanting more of you. Not because you weren't working when you were there, but because you did an awesome job when you were there. Never leave a job and have the employer go, Whew, 
<laughs> Boy, am I glad that's over. Always leave a job and leave that employer wanting more of you in a positive sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Hello? Is anybody awake yes. here besides me? Yes. Good, two of us. Two of us are awake. <laughs> Always leave your employer wanting more. Does that make sense? If we can be employees like that, you'll never go hungry. In bad times, in good times, it doesn't matter. Employers are looking for men who will produce. Yes, sir? It's kind of like when you go to work and your uh, supervisor or your uh, boss says, you know, hey, go outside and clean this up or yep. hey, you know, go do this on the job. And when you do that and you complete it, uh, like a whole satisfaction, then your boss will be like, well, he's, he got that done today. Let's see what he can do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. See, we're so afraid that they're going to take advantage, people are taking advantage of us. That's because we've taken advantage of others. Okay? Let your employer take a little advantage of it. Show him what you're made of. Prove to him that you're worthy of hire. Prove to him he's going to get a good eight hours worth of work out of an eight hour day pay. If you're getting 40 hours a week these days, you can really thank God. That's, a, that's an act of God. <laughs> okay? So, we're living in times when we need to begin to recognize that we need to shine like the stars of heaven when it comes to being men of God and men are in employment. We need to be the supernatural ones. And we can be. All we got to do is keep looking to God. We're serving God. We're doing it for Him. And uh, you watch how God will reward you for that. What is 1 Timothy? Did we just read 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2? No. no. Would we read that? Would somebody read that for me, please? All slaves should, sh should show full respect for their masters, so they will not bring shame on the name of God and His teachings. See, we're bringing shame on the name of God and His teachings unless we give our employers a full everything we got. We're bringing shame on God. The whole key, the whole purpose behind this little class is to help you understand the keys to becoming blessings on all occasions. Every thought, every action, every word affects somebody. See, just negative thoughts about your employer is eventually going to affect your employer. And it's going to affect other, 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 uh, other uh, employees. And then it will begin to affect, affect your family. It spreads like a cancer. So we're dishonoring God when we don't give our employers our best. Remember your goal for being employed. What was the goal for getting a job in the first place? Take care of your family. Yourself. Take care of your family. Take care of life. Right? But, in, but now we have a new goal for getting a job, and that's to do what? Honor God. We're honoring God. And fortunately or unfortunately, the economy of the earth means we've got to produce something to get something. Get out of this mentality that the world owes you something. The world don't owe you and me anything. God doesn't owe you and me anything. We've already got more than we deserve, right? Just by our salvation and, and God... Knowing God loves us, that's more than we earned or more than we deserve. The whole, the whole nation, our nation is being destroyed by the idea that the government and the world owes me something. They don't owe us anything. Nothing. Huh? You gotta work for it. It's like in any other time in life and it's any other time in history. If we don't produce, we don't gain. I, 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 one, of, one of the uh, forefathers said one time, and I forget who it was that said this, but a democracy will last as long as it takes the population. Uh, let's see. A, a, a democracy will last and thrive until the population learns they can vote themselves a raise from the treasury. 
And that's really what our, our world's involved in right now. Politicians are promising things to get votes at the expense of the productivity of our nation and everything else. And so we get this whole world's getting this idea that the world owes us something. And we have this mentality of, it's a poverty mentality is what it is. And so we need to shake that off. We're serving God. All right? Give your employer your very best. In the company of children, anybody in here have children? You're all going to be in the company of children occasionally. <laughs> yes. As students here, we have a general rule that children, we don't touch them. Touch them. They may come up to you and want to talk to you while well, you get down on your knee and you talk to them maybe, but you don't hoist them and bounce them around because we don't want to hurt anybody and we don't want any accusations to, to go the wrong way for you guys. Never provoke a child to wrath. You know what that means? It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. It means to tease without mercy, to provoke them to anger. I've known uh, over the years working with a lot of hurting people. I've had uh, many hurting people who, while they were children, were uh, maybe <clears throat> held down by a big brother or a father that wasn't thinking or tickled mercilessly. You know what I mean? <laughs> quit, 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 quit. You know, and and uh, all of a sudden anger erupts because why? You've you've Push that person beyond what would be considered fun and cause them to, to be wrathful, angry. And that's, a, that's a, a torment. That's tormenting. We don't want to do that. Don't torment. Never provoke your children to wrath. Matthew 18, 3 through 6. Would somebody check that out for me? Would somebody look up Matthew 10. All right, go ahead. Uh, and he said, I tell you the this truth. This is Matthew 18. Mm -hmm. All right. I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's stop right there for a second. Unless you change and become like little children. What's he talking about? Being submissive. Being childish or what? Being submissive. Being submissive. Anybody else got something to add to that? Being respectful. Uh, kids aren't always too respectful, but what is it top? Unless you change and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. How about believe? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Kids don't doubt. You tell a kid something, they're going to believe you. And God says he wants us to be just like that. He wants us to believe. Unless you believe. Unless you submit to it and believe, you'll never enter now, go ahead. Continue reading, please. Matthew 18, mm -hmm. 3 through 6. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned to the depths of the sea. Doesn't sound pretty, does it? Anyone who causes a child to sin. He said, it's not going to go well with you. <laughs> so first of all, God says, I want you to become like a child. I want you to believe. I want you to submit. I want you to be a childlike. And uh, he says, whoever becomes like one of these children becomes the <clears throat> biggest in the kingdom, actually, is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. But don't provoke children to wrath and don't cause a child to sin. Why? It's not a good thing. You know what abuse is? Yeah. Look at this definition. Abuse, causing the victim to believe they are responsible for the actions being taken. Causing deliberate misinterpretation of an experience. That's what abuse is. Do you understand that? When we... If a per, when a person abuses another person, they're always, well I shouldn't say always, they're most generally going to make that other person, try to make that other person believe that it's their fault that, it's, that it occurred. Okay? Um, let's say a parent is too harsh on a child. 
uh, always getting angry with a child. There's a case before the courts right now of a man who's on trial because his, what, two-month-old or six-month-old baby got beat around pretty bad. Um, I've ministered to a lot of people who were victims of abuse. And in every case, the abuse victim always believes that the perpetrator or the situation that occurred to them was their fault. That's the part of the abuse that tormented that person. The bumps and bruises and terrible things like that that we do physically to one another, that heals. But the thing that is hard to heal, that torments people forever and drives them in the wrong direction, are the feelings that it's all my fault, I should have stopped it, etc., etc., etc. Real abuse is causing the, the abused victim to believe that the, the actions was their fault. Okay? So we've got to be cautious how we deal with children, how we deal with people in general. When you, when you talk to a child, get down on your knee. Look them in the eye. Can you imagine what it looks like to a kid to always look them up our nose? I mean, just think about it. It's kind of, kind of scary anyway, right, to a child. So if we're going to approach a child to communicate, we need to get down on their level and look them in the eye. That just kind of minimizes us and helps them feel a little more secure. All right? Never minimize a child's feelings. Do you know what it means to minimize a child's feelings? Do you know what it means to minimize anyone's feelings? What does it mean to minimize somebody's feelings? Like for a child, um, you look at them, oh, it's not that big of a deal. They don't understand what's going on anyway. Yeah, no, that's not a big deal. Quit crying. Knock it off. Same. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Uh, an example I use to help understand how to deal with the, let's say a mother or a father takes their child to the bus stop or the school bus picks them up and they're in their first grade or not very old and the child is afraid because they're sitting there waiting for the bus to come and this child feels fear. To minimize that child would be to say, oh, it's silly, don't be, don't be fearful, that's silly. Why are you afraid? You're going to get on the bus, Bus driver's going to take you and deliver you to your classroom. When, when the day is done, the teacher's going to put you back on the bus, and the bus driver will bring you right back here, and I'll be waiting for you. So don't be silly. That's minimizing the child. That's minimizing that child's feelings. The better way to handle that would be to tell the child that you understand. You're afraid. I understand. It's a big bus. It is kind of scary. Once you agree that the child's feelings are legitimate, now they're, they're encouraged. Believe it or not, they're encouraged. They're encouraged to listen to what else you have to say. If you just say, don't be silly, don't be afraid, that's, that's, don't be a baby, quit being a baby. Well, you've turned that child off to receive anything from you. There's nothing else that child's going to hear from you because that child automatically is in themselves believing that they're weak, they're a baby, they're something that they're not. Again, making them believe something that's not true. Understand? So if, if a child is struggling with fear or something of that nature, help, help, your, help that child by understanding. I understand. It is a fearful world. And yet this is what's going to happen. Walk the child through what's going to happen. And help that child find some comfort with wherever they're at, you see. Don't minimize other people. What does it do when you minimize somebody? What did it do when you were minimized? Oh, that's silly. Grow up. Shake it off. Quit being such a wimp. What do these statements do to you? What did they do to you? Cuts you off from your potential. Cuts you off from your potential. It makes you believe even as an adult that you ain't worth nothing. Makes you believe as an adult that you're worthless. Absolutely. What else? Causes you to hide from your feelings, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. From that point on, what they're saying is it's not legal for you to have feelings. Or your feelings don't count. <coughs> if they... It will in a way make you put on a mask. Makes you wear a phony mask, which is what everyone pretty much is doing. They're wearing their phony little masks. 
We're trying to be something we're really not on the inside. Because why? People minimized them someplace in life, made them feel like their feelings were not valid. If your feelings aren't valid, then let me tell you, you're not valid. That's really what we, what we process inside. If my feelings are not valid, if what I'm feeling isn't true, then I must not be true. Something's wrong with me. So I think there's a question on the quiz that says, what happens when you make a person, when you minimize a person's feelings? And the answer would be, it destroys them. They won't be receptive to the next thing you have to say. And what it makes them feel, what it, what it does to them, it makes them hide from their feelings. That's the biggie. It makes them hide from their feelings, refuse to think they have feelings that are valid anymore. That's a horrible thing. Anybody in here experienced anything like that in life? Anybody in here not experienced something like that in life? So you've learned now what not to do <laughs> by experience, right? Minimization is a terrible thing. So is invading their space. Okay. <laughs> in a public place. Tear everything up and you leave it alone. <laughs> Tear it up and leave it alone. That's the way the world does. Pl leave the place better than you found it. When, we, when I was a kid, I lived in Colorado and we, would, uh, we lived out in the plains and on weekends, long weekends, we would uh, travel to the mountains and camp out and uh, fish. Good times, right? My grandmother and grandfather always went with us, or went with us quite a lot. And my grandmother was always a stickler for leaving the place better than we found it. <laughs> Regardless of the condition of that campsite when we pulled in, I guarantee you when we left, if my grandma had anything to say about it, that campsite was clean enough. <laughs> it looked like nobody had ever been there. And she, and she constantly instilled in us, leave a place better than you found it. If you didn't like the way it looked when you got here, make it look good for somebody else when they get here. Right? So when we're in public places, we're to improve it, not <laughs> destroy it. Beware of others around you. When you're in public, guess what? That means there's other people around you. Or the potential of other people being around you, right? What's the point behind that? What's the, what's the... Be careful what you're saying. Oh, that would be good. Be careful what you're saying. Be careful how you talk. Be careful how you respond, react. Remember, you're never alone, <laughs> right? Even if you think you are, you're never alone. Be courteous. Language, comments, and remarks. Colossians 3, 8. Would somebody read that for me, please? Colossians 3, 8. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old feelings, your old evil nature. Stripped off your old evil nature and all its wicked deeds. Is that not it? That's not it. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Colossians 3, 8. But now it is time to get rid of anger, rage, and malice, 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 the hater, slander, and dirty language. There you go. When you're in a public place, beware how you talk. Beware how you respond to other people. Beware what you say. I've, I've had grandchildren in all levels of ball, and uh, I'm. You go to a ballpark and you hear people bashing these little kids because they're oh, yeah. not catching the ball, not running fast enough, not doing this, not doing that, without any thought that their parents or their grandparents are probably sitting right around them. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. How inconsiderate. How in fights and whatnot. Yeah, it's you crazy. Know, kids game. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So be considerate of how you respond and how you react and what you say, things you talk about when there's, when you're, when there's others around you. Because... Uh, you never know. I might be listening. Add positive to the atmosphere. Add something positive to the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? It's so easy to get swept up in negativity. Man, it's like a cancer. 
<laughs> but we've got to be able to say, no, we're not negative people. Add some positive to the comments that's taken place. I don't care if the umpire did make a bad call. I'm glad I wasn't umpiring, <laughs> right? Thank God somebody else has volunteered to do it. Thank God somebody else has taken care of it. There's always something to add that's positive to the atmosphere. Don't fall in with the negativity of the crowd. Stand up for righteousness. What does that mean? Stand Talk to me. Stand up for what you believe in. Uh, what you think is right. If it's righteous, what's righteousness? Well, somebody, there's an instance somebody sees that, that somebody's doing something wrong, you know, you stand up for that person and, and agree with them. Um, to, okay, but what's righteousness? Who is our righteousness? Lord. God. Christ Jesus has become for us our righteousness, wisdom from heaven, and so forth. Now, does that mean we go to a public place and preach? Well, if we want to. No, but that's not what it's talking about. What we need to do is to recognize that we are gods, and we need to be purveyors of peace and righteousness, right way of living, <coughs> right? Right way of living, right with God, being right with God. If you, if you think, ooh, God's not going to appreciate this, then that's not righteousness. That's unrighteous behavior. So stand up for righteousness. Stand up for what's right. Stand up for what you know we're supposed to be doing. Okay? Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. All right. In public places, again, ladies first. Be polite. Be gentlemen. Don't uh, push and shove. Those are childish ways of behavior. Honor the flag. How do we honor the flag, gentlemen? We stand, we at least stand straight with attention, take our hats off. Uh, I like to stand with my hand on my heart. Uh, I think that's just honoring the flag and all that that flag stands for. We are blessed people who have been blessed by God to be in this nation. Greatest place on earth. It's the only nation on earth people die to get into. Crazy, isn't it? But it's still the way it is. And so, honor the flag that represents this nation. Hats off, attention, look at the flag, right hand on the heart, etc. Don't invade another person's space. Got me? Yeah. <laughs> how about, uh, how do we behave with our wives and children? Wives and children, we're going to talk about how to deal with Machismo. our children. Ephesians 5, 25, and Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. I need a good loud reader. Ephesians 5, 25, last verse in Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Hold it right there. Husbands, love your wives. And what? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. How do we love our wives like Christ loved the church? What does that mean? Do forgiving. Hmm? Forgiving, self-sacrificing. Okay. Think of her Serving. first. Pardon? Think of her first before you think of yourself. Okay. And, and whatever you do. All right. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Does, does Christ browbeat us? No. Does Christ demand from us? No. Christ does what for us? Everything. Loves us. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, not the wrath of God. It's the gentleness of God that attracted us to Him. It's the mercy of God that endures forever and constantly pulls people to Him. And that's the way God wants us to love our wives. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now, let's see. I think it's probably in here. Yep, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. Listen to this. This is uh, first cha chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is what I call, and what is labeled in my Bible, the principles, New Testament principles for marriage. Chapter 7, verse 3. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. 
and likewise also the wife to her husband. Do you realize in Scripture when things are mentioned, they're mentioned in order of importance? You understand? Mm -hmm. The first person mentioned that has a duty or responsibility in verse 3 was who? Husband. husband. That's where it starts. Family relationship, wife interaction, husband-wife interaction. The responsibility lays heavily, strictly on the back of the, pa uh, of the pastor. The back of the, the husband as to how that marriage is going to go. Husbands... <laughs> Love your wives and render to her, the, uh, to the wife, the affection to her. Now, what does that mean? Talk to me about what that means. Respecting her, uh, doing for her when uh, she, you know, uh, just to help, 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 you know, beyond what you normally do. Like, you go All to right. work, and you go home, and, and, and you do for her also. All right. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, and it says, uh, give her her due respect because she's raising your children as well. She's helping you, and uh, you know she's there for you as you were there for her. So okay. she deserves the same amount of respect as you do. Husbands, render to your wives the affection due her. Yes, sir. Uh, Larry, I have an NASB, and uh, yes. it's, it's worded a little different. Uh, I bet it is. It says, uh, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And then uh, the, the notes on that, it says, uh, fulfill his duty. Uh, married believers are not to sexually deprive their spouses. While celibacy, celibacy is right for, a single, for the single, it is wrong for the married. Uh, the practice of deprivation may have been the most common when a believer had an unsafe spouse. For, uh, for more on unsafe spouses, see the notes on verses 10. Now, is that a note off of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3? Yeah. I find that interesting, and that's why I raise this question. Because, listen, let me read 1 Corinthians 7, 3 and 4. Okay, listen to this. Let, your husband, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. That's the first thing said. And the second thing, likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5. Do not deprive one another except for consent or with consent for a time. Verse 5, we're getting into the act of, the, the, the act of sex or the, the uh, intimacy. But verse 3, we're not there yet. Listen, listen to me. Verse 3 says this. Husbands, render to your wives the affection due her. Let me tell you short and sweet what that means. It means meet, help meet your wife's emotional needs. Unless a woman's emotional needs are taken care of, there will be no sex. If it is, it won't be very good. Why? Because a woman's needs, need, the woman's emotional needs must be met before she can physiologically do anything. Now, how do we meet a wife's emotional needs? And it also says, once the wife's emotional need, likewise wife, now you meet the emotional needs of your husband. Well, what does that mean? See, we, we always, when we start thinking of husband and wife relationships, we immediately think of the bedroom. And that's why most, to be real honest, that's why many marriages fail. That's why most, or many at least, Women endure the marriage bed rather than enjoy it. Because men, even the church says, here's the biggest thing. We're logging off. Here's the biggest thing. You meet the sexual needs of your spouse. That's not what the Bible's saying. First things first. The first thing is, husband, meet the emotional needs of your wife. Now, how do we do that? We listen to her. You stay her. Listen to her. What'd you say? Um, lift her up. Or Encourage her. Let me give you a clue as to how to meet your wife's emotional needs. <clears throat> you, it doesn't take very long to be with a person to understand what it takes to make them happy, mad, glad, or sad. Right? Well, if you're going to meet their emotional needs, you're going to make them happy and glad. If you don't meet their emotional needs, most likely they're mad and sad, right? So now, how, what does it take to meet that woman's emotional needs? Every woman is different. Every woman needs, a, needs to have affection, needs to have affirmation, needs to have encouragement, their own special way, depending upon the person. My wife needs tons of I love yous. 
And then every once in a while she'll say, talk is cheap, which means now I gotta give her a hug. <laughs> you know, men have this idea, well, you know, if I'm still around then I must love you. That's no proof of your love. Proof of your love is are you meeting the woman's emotional needs. Let me tell you something. Every man has met their wife's emotional needs at one time in life or the wife would never have said, I do. So what it, what it takes to meet a wife's emotional needs after you're married 20 years, 30 years, 40 years is the same thing it took to meet that wife's emotional needs before you ever got married. Uh, there's a, my computer shut down which is very interesting. I wonder why. I guess it decided that uh, it's time to quit. Hmm. But there's a, there's a, on that, do you have your copy of the foil? Do you have your copy? Let me see this. Yes. Um, well, it's on the second. That's on the next frame. We're going to, we're going to, I'll worry about that a little bit later. But right now, do you understand what it means to meet the wife's emotional needs? Emotional needs are what it takes to make a person feel emotionally secure. My wife in public likes for me to have my hand on her or my, holding her hand. Just makes her feel emotionally secure, makes her feel attached. Some people aren't that way. Some people don't want your arm around them. Some people don't want to hold hands in public. That's because they're different. Their temperaments are different, you see. So we've got, to, we've got to understand what is it that our wife needs. Whatever it took for you to get her is what it's going to take for you to keep her. Pretty simple. Can you remember that? That's a million dollars worth of advice. WWAF. What works at first. And then the next is what? WWF? Will work forever. It's not World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> WWF, WWF. What works at first will work forever. That is a scripture, that, or that is an attitude and an understanding you need to have deeply implanted in your mind when it comes to winning and keeping a wife. All right? Well, I've kind of lost where I'm going. Yeah, we jumped pretty far ahead. We're right there. I know. First 55, eight. I know. Go, yeah, open to 1 Timothy 5 8 for me, please. 1 Timothy 5 8, please. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith, and he is worse than a sinner. He is denied the faith, and worse than a sinner. That sounds pretty serious. What does it mean to provide? Emotionally, physically, financially, all aspects. All aspects of provision. Don't think that just providing financially and physically is uh, enough. When it comes to families, it's not enough. The most important provision you can give is the emotional, spiritual provision to help that family feel secure. Do you realize that unless a man is following God and loving his wife and rendering to the affection according to what God says, unless a man is doing what Ephesians talks about, loving your wife as Christ loves the church. Here's another way Christ loves the church. Christ is always, or desiring always, to give us revelation understanding of who God is. You understand that? The Bible says in Ephesians that we need to wash our wives with the water of the word. What's that talking about? That's talking about sharing the revelations God gives you with your wife. And pray with her. Listen to me. This is what this does. This makes the woman feel spiritually and emotionally secure. Well, what if your wife doesn't have a spiritual life with the Lord? Well, then you need to lead her in that direction. Not push her and beat her into it, but lead her into it. Lead her into it by being a man of God. Being a man of faith. Because that woman will never be totally secure or feel totally secure in a peace of life until she's got a man who's following God. Okay? That's the number one, that's the number one uh, responsibility, guys, for taking care of a wife. 
make them feel, make them recognize they're emotionally, spiritually connected and secure. What's the next scripture? First uh, Corinthians or Second Corinthians twelve fourteen. Twelve fourteen. What does that say? Here is the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I seek, uh, for I do not seek what is yours, but uh, but you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. What's that talking about? What does that What does that say to you? Talk to me, guys. What's that saying to you? Read it in your own translation. Read it in your translation. If you've got a different translation. Parents are financially responsible for their children, not the children, vice versa. Not the children. Parents go. Yeah. All right. So what everybody gets out of that? When we have a family, we're financially responsible for that family. We're to, we're to supply for that family. Timothy said, unless we, unless we supply for that family, we're worse than a non-believer. Well, there's another good reason to work, isn't it? And Corinthians say that it's up to the parents to provide for their children. Not wait for their children to provide for them. I can't imagine that happening, but I'm sure it does someplace. <clears throat> 